Hey everybody, this is Chris Webster with Team Black, and this is the mapping video, so let's get going. First, welcome to Team Black. Thanks for staying current, learning new things, and supporting archaeological education and outreach. Uh, if you're seeing this, you're either a professional subscriber to the Archaeology Podcast Network, or you're a Patre Patreon subscriber. So either way, thank you very much. Check out our other resources, arccert.black, arcpodnet.com, and the parent website for all of this, digtech-llc.com. Here's what we're going to learn today. We're going to learn about the UTM grid, where did it come from, what's it based on, how do we use it, township and range system, uh, Smithsonian trinomials, and basic site mapping. All of this has some, well, township and range and Smithsonian trinomials have some pretty fascinating backgrounds, so we're going to learn about that too. Um, basic site mapping, pace mapping, and finalizing. You might think, well, I use a GPS, but it's good to know that stuff so you can understand where the foundation for all that comes from. A little bit about me, I'm an archaeologist, author, and podcaster. You can find my media page at digtech-llc.com forward slash media. Uh, as far as archaeology goes, um, I have started in about 2004. I got my BA of Anthropology in uh, University of North Dakota in 2005, started Serum Archaeology in 2005, and I got my master's at the University of Georgia at Athens in 2010 in archaeological resource management, and I wrote a book called the Field Archaeologist Survival Guide, um, and started the Archaeology Podcast Network in 2014. Wow, I didn't realize that was both in 2014 until I wrote it down. Anyway, okay, so um, everything else I do, um, I was also in the U.S. Navy. Uh, I'm a pilot, licensed pilot, and consider myself a digital archaeologist, and I am in the Civil Air Patrol as a volunteer. I'm actually the squadron commander of the Reno Composite Squadron, assuming you're listening to this in 2019. Okay, so let's first talk about the UTM grid. This is it. This is all it is. Uh, if you look here, you'll notice that there are columns and rows, and the uh, columns are numbered, and they are numbered all the way uh, across the country there, uh, or across the world, and then you can see the uh, rows going up and down, and those are lettered. Now, the southern hemisphere down at the south-south pole, you can see that's just A and B for the lower half, and then Y and Z for the upper uh, North Pole portion, um, Eastern Hemisphere and Western Hemisphere. But we generally don't have to worry about that. When you're finding a UTM grid location, and if you look over here on, say, Western United States where I'm at, I look at column 11 and then row T. So every Easting and Northing starts with an, an 11 and a T. And you'll see why in a minute when we go over what this looks like. Let's zoom in. This is the best graphic I could find, so apologies for the clarity of it. But this is the United States. You can see we're covered from, in the continental United States anyway, from 10 all the way over to about 18 or 19, give or take. Okay, so this was developed by the U.S. military basically to make math easier. You start with a point. We got one right there and another point right there. And you want to know the distance between those two points. Well, the best way to do that is the Pythagorean theorem which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now, if you've got these points, and let's say you've got latitude and longitude, so if you can square 32 degrees, 16 minutes, 31.123 seconds, and then plus negative 119 degrees, 45 minutes, 21.234 seconds, if you can square that, then you're an uber genius and you're probably not watching this video. But most people can't. So what they did was they came up with a system that didn't have any negative numbers and just had regular positive numbers. So you can square, might take a little long, long hand math, but with a calculator, it's pretty easy. You can square that number and that number and then get that number. So that is, um, it's a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So that final answer is the unsquared version of those two numbers added together. And that is the distance, that is c. And it's all in meters usually for the UTM grid. So it's based on the Mercator projection, which basically lays the planet out flat on a sheet of paper. Um, and then they laid this grid over the top of it. So that's what UTM is called, Universal Transverse Mercator. So uses in archaeology, uh, this is how we look at it here. Of course, you've got your northing and your easting. And this is not just archaeology, this is everything. But anything to the north is your, is your northing. That's, your, that's your, your distance there. And then you've got your easting. So a typical coordinate is going to have several components. Like I mentioned, you need your grid location, so 11S in this case, and then 
2609.09 meters east by 433.9066 meters north, and that gives you a location on a UTM grid. Now, let's take a look at that one more time. When we're looking at this, what this means is each box in that UTM grid is 1 million meters wide, and your easting is from zero to a million. That's where you're at within that box. However, your northing is not the north-south distance of that box. Your northing is your distance from the equator. So if you're walking a northing, like you're walking east-west on a northing, on a, on a distance from the equator, on a northing, you're actually paralleling the equator if you're staying at that heading and, and at that northing, which is a pretty cool concept to think about. So that's why there's no negative numbers. When you move over to, say, 10S, um, you go to the, to the west and you go to 10S, then your numbers on your easting start over, but your northing does not. It's still a distance from the equator. So uh, 10S is going to be, again, starting over in the easting, one to one million uh, meters. Now, if you go down to the southern hemisphere, you might think those are negative numbers because you're going in the southern hemisphere, but it's still distance to the equator. So it's still a positive number. It's just going south this time. So a coordinate in the southern hemisphere would actually be an easting and a southing, I guess. I don't know if they call it that, but an easting and a southing. Um, here we have eastings and northings. Uh, and it's not called a westing. It's always called an easting, <laughs> no matter where you're at in the globe. Okay, so township and range uh, was developed by the Public Land Survey System um, a long time ago. And Thomas Jefferson actually came up with it. And it was used as a way to really... Uh, figure out how to legally describe the land that was east or west of what had already been decided on. Um, so by the time Thomas Jefferson came up with it. So much of the East Coast was already inhabited, uh, so to speak. But they were giving out land and trying to settle the rest of the country, and they needed a way to legally describe that. So he came up with this, um, and, and it was developed further later on, the public land survey system. So you'll notice on this system here, we have a whole bunch of base meridians all over the uh, country. And your townships and range, as we'll see in a minute, are based on these baselines and uh, meridians. So over here in the west, we have the Mount Diablo um, meridian and baseline right there. So all the township and range coordinates are based on those. And then you get up here into Washington and then uh, down here into Southern California. Arizona's got its own. Utah's got its own with a little exception right there. So you can see there's little bits all over the place here where they have these baselines and meridians. Um, it looks like places like Colorado and Wyoming, they don't even have it covering the rest of the state. It's just that little pocket right there and that little pocket right there for one reason or another. There are some exceptions to this, which we'll go over in a second. So using township and range, um, we use it for property descriptions. The legal description of an archeological site is usually using township and range, um, and it can also be used for navigation. This is generally what it looks like. You have sections um, that are six miles by six miles, um, or blocks, I should say, and then there's sections within there. So if you look at this area down here, this is a six mile by six mile block, and it's got these sections that snake on down right through there. And then when you look at those sections, they break up into quadrants, and each quadrant breaks up into infinite number of quadrants. Um, typically, when you talk about a quarter quarter section, um, that's how things are described. You would say, uh, let's say for this one, Township 1 North, Range 3 West, and Section 13 in the Northwest Quadrant, or you could say the North Half or the West Half, but you could say the uh, Northeast Quadrant, Northeast Quadrant of that. So the Northeast Quarter and then the Northeast Quarter, and then you could just keep going quarter, quarter, quarter. But if somebody asked you for the quarter, quarter section, you'd say, well, the site could be in the Southeast Quadrant and the Northwest Quadrant quarter of that. So it'd be southeast quarter, then northwest quarter. can get confusing, but once you see it, you're just really drilling down using this system, uh, what you're actually talking about. And an archaeological site can span, obviously, <laughs> multiple quadrants here. So you might have multiple township and range coordinates to describe it. Okay, so one of the exceptions I mentioned is Louisiana, and they use the French Arpent system. So there are Arpents and Arpents within Arpents, and it's crazy. It was designed so uh, it was used in Louisiana, I should say, because there's a lot of water down there, and people wanted water from property, partially for farming and things like that. So there are these long, skinny things because every single one of those parcels has access to the waterfront uh, and access to the to the farmland. So 
Uh, that's why they came up with that. But you've got township and range still, but then the French ARPIN system um, after that. Here's a standard uh, quad map. Uh, you can see here, there's a whole area within the middle here that has actually uh, no township and range designated within that quad section. But then you go over here and you see these red lines. The red lines are the township and range system. And when I zoom in, I can see the major lines down here. So this is Township 22 South and then Township 23 South right here. Um, so if I wanted to figure out where a site was, let's say it was at this intersection right here, there's little plastic um, map guides that you can get that you overlay on these sections and then you can find out what section you're in. But So if I look here, I'm in Township 22 South. I don't know what the range is. I'd have to look at the edge of the map, but range something or other, uh, section 31. Okay, those are the big sections I mentioned. And then the site's down over here. So it's in the southwest quarter and probably the south half of that southwest quarter. Um, I could probably get a little more detailed and say it's in the um, southwest quarter of the southeast quarter. So that's how you decide where your property is from a legal standpoint. Okay, now let's look at Smithsonian Trinomial. So once we figure out what our site is, we then give it typically, not everywhere, but typically a Smithsonian trinomial number. And here's an example, 9 p.m. 201. So let's break that down uh, in a minute. First, we're gonna talk about the history. So it was developed based around the um, Civilian Conservation Corps and the um, River Basin Surveys and uh, in, the, in the Eastern United States. And essentially the Smithsonian was um, the custodians, because there was no state historic preservation officer or anything like that. So the Smithsonian were the custodians of the information that was being recorded as a result of all these excavations. And they needed a way to figure out how to do it. Now, a lot of people locally were giving their sites various numbers, but the Smithsonian was like, well, we need a way to uh, figure out everywhere where this is going to work. So we can tell just by looking at a number, what state it's in, what county it's in, and, and when it was discovered. So if you break down 9 p.m. 201, um, 9 is the number given to the state of Georgia in this case. P.m. is the county, and it means Putnam County. It's always two characters, sometimes three, but most of the time two. Um, and then 201 is the 201st site number given out in that county without respect for uh, historic or prehistoric. It's just whatever the whoever the body is that's handing out site numbers, that was the 201st site given out in Putnam County. So you can tell about when the site was recorded, if you know any history of the county and the archaeology there, if you had just a stack of site records, you could say, hey, 201 is older than 2001, you know, something like that, um, because that was a later site number issued. Some other systems, uh, California, New Mexico, the, the Laboratory of Anthropology at the University of New Mexico um, has their own system for site numbers. And then California has their own system as well. They also have primary numbers, which are a completely different thing, but they have their own trinomial, basically, and it's based on the um, the counties within California and then the sites recorded there. So very similar to the rest of the systems, but it's not uh, it's not as universal. It's got their own they've got their own way of doing things. Okay, so now that you got all that down, um, let's talk about some basic site mapping: paper versus GPS. So. Many of you probably have never recorded on paper before. Uh, if you have, then great. But if you haven't, and it's unlikely that you have, but um, you're probably recording on GPS. But one of the th reasons why I like people to understand how to record on paper is because it allows you to, when you're drawing, really look at the landscape and look at the landforms and the vegetation and things like that. And, and you want to put in these extra elements to, to kind of spruce up your map. But when you're doing it on GPS, it's a little more cumbersome because you've got to now select a new shape and go out and do this thing and then give it a label and all that stuff. And then somebody's got to come in on the, on the website and, and fix all that and make it look good. And, uh, or these days overlay it on a, on a photographic aerial or satellite map. And, uh, and that's what we do. And that's okay if that's what your company is doing. But if you want a little more detail, sometimes it's handy to know how to, um, how to record by paper. And one of the things you're going to need to be able to do that is your pace because you're going to be walking this stuff out. So, the best way to find your pace is to lay out or mark with a GPS, a really accurate GPS, 30 meters. So 1.0 to 30 meters in a straight line with no obstructions. And then you essentially just walk that at a normal pace and count. And you can probably do it three or four times and take an average. 
but just walk it at a normal pace. Don't try to stretch out your legs or anything like that. Um, don't jog it. Don't, you know, stumble or anything like that. Just walk at a normal pace and count how many paces you have. That way, you know, when you're walking on the field, you can say, hey, when I walk 10 paces on the average eight meters or something like that, you can just calculate that down. We typically say 30 meters because a lot of transects are 30 meters wide. So when you're pacing on your transects, you can, you know, how many steps you got to walk. So that's the first thing you need. Um, then you got to know what to record. Um, obviously, we record all kinds of stuff, cans, rock art, fence lines, roads. And these are, you know, these are things that... Uh, you might not necessarily even um, be historic within the site or, or prehistoric for that matter. But if it's in there and it's impacting it, then it should probably be on the map. Um, mining features, that's a head frame. Uh, we got rock outcrops, streams, and trees. Maybe not trees filled with goats, but trees. So all this stuff, some of these things on the bottom here are things that people forget to put in on their GPS map. Uh, they just record the artifacts and features and forget to record things like rock outcrops and streams because they are important and they affect the site and how the site develops. So you want to make sure you get that stuff on there. Here's an example map and it's put over a, a poor resolution quad map um, that was probably zoomed in too far. And you can see here that we have the site boundary. We've got this stream and it doesn't quite match up with the stream that's on the map, which is good to know. There's an aspen grove right there that was important because there are arboglyphs in there. We've got a haul road here, um, some equipment area there, and uh, and a fence line there. So, um, and then of course a scale and a and a north arrow. But you can see how we have all this information here overlaid on the top of uh, another map here, so you can show where the reality is versus um, what the map shows. Okay, so that's it. Um, there's of course a lot more to all this stuff, but this is a basic introduction to mapping and the different types of mapping systems that we use and the different mapping elements that we use. If you got any questions, you can send an email to chris at digtech-llc.com. If you found this on the Archaeology Podcast Network and want to support us on Patreon, that's great. Um, but if you're on Patreon and want to go listen to podcasts, they're always free, but you can uh, uh, we can upgrade you to a APN professional account and you get all this stuff is included in that account, plus some other swag and early downloads and things like that. So check it all out, arcpodnet.com forward slash members. Otherwise, patreon.com forward slash team black for all your videos. And feel free to suggest more to us at that same address below. Thank you.